Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Um, Tim, amazing to be able to be with you. Uh, again, you, as you know, are, are certainly one of my favorites over the past 10 years to, to speak with uh, and to be very candid and, uh, and frank and, and really understand what's going on in the world. So thank you again for your time. Awesome. It's great, great seeing you. And I'm still disappointed I, you know, that, you know, that you're, you're not on our television anymore. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully everyone's using their iPads, right? Or, Fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I am, so that's all that matters. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I want to first have everybody understand kind of who you are in terms of the investment industry and, and for people to understand that, you know, you've been in the fixed income markets, the bond markets since your Drexel Burnham days. And that's probably not everybody understands how significant that firm was or is to the fixed income market with that Michael Milken, et cetera. Like that, that's your background. Um, so talk just briefly about that. And, uh, and then also, of course, what you're doing right now. And then we'll get into the details in terms of what's going on in the markets. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, basically, if, if you go all the way back to the early 80s, um, you know, the, the, the bond market the, in, in the bond market was an investment grade market, which simply meant that if you weren't triple B or above, you really had no access to long term capital. And Michael Milken's idea was to say that, look, you know, there are a lot of great businesses that are maybe smaller, earlier stage that, you know, could use a larger amount of capital. Because at that time, you know, in many ways, it's kind of like, you know, the, the antiquated markets and some of these markets up in, in, even in Canada or in Europe, where they're bank dominated, right? So if you're looking for a loan, I've got to have collateral, I've got to have all of these wonderful things, and I don't get an advance that really means anything. So Milken basically said, look, at the end of the day, you know, we can, we can give you 10-year financing, interest only, um, expensive interest rate, but it's tax deductible. So your after-tax cost of capital was something reasonable, and could you use it, right? I mean, it, it was actually kind of funny, I think, because now that you're thinking, we, he, he built something called the strawberry field. He went out to insurance companies and savings and loans and investors, and he said, look, if I had a portfolio that was going to yield 15%, but it would default at 4% a year, which was the historical number, and I recovered 50 cents, I have a 2% loss rate, I'm going to kind of net 13 or 12 or something like that, would you be interested? And everybody came back and said, yeah, I'd love it. And he goes, okay, well, I don't actually have anything, but I mean, if you would be interested, that'd be great. So he built the buy side and then he went out and he went to the companies and, and things like, I mean, people take this stuff for granted, but CNN was a great example, Penn Turner, right? When he was starting that network, um, oh. that's a, that's a big build out. That's your industry, right? So you're looking at it going, how much it costs to build a, you know, to, to, to build, you know, studios and, and national, uh, you know, uh, force and all the rest of it. So you're looking at going, that's, you know, that's, back then now it's billions. That was hundreds of millions of dollars. That guy got laughed out of every bank in the world. Right. And it's like, so we, became that financing source and invented really the original issue, high yield or junk bond market. And for, you know, for simplicity, all it is, is just, it's, it's below, it's basically below triple B. Um, well, that, wait, that, Tim, that's fascinating. See, you're telling me that CNN was essentially one of your first clients ever uh, in the high yield and what used to be called the junk bond market. And that it was Michael Milken kind of putting that together with Ted Turner. 100%. Um, huh. And that, that, that included guys like Craig McCaw of McCaw Cellular. So the whole cellular industry was another one, right? The telco. And you and I were just, uh, you know, chatting offline a little bit about um, the cell towers, right? And I said, you know, that was one of my most interesting uh, opportunities in my entire career. You, you looked and you said, all right, in 2002, that little thing that was called a BlackBerry was just getting going. And I remember re recalling, looking out my window, my office in Santa Barbara at the time, and, and I, wondered, I wondered to myself, you know, is this going to be ubiquitous, right? Is this going to be something that everybody's going to have? Because everybody, you know, again, time, you know, makes us all pretty smart, but, or dumb, but, but you look at it going, you didn't know. And so I remember having a meeting with a friend of mine and I said, you know, if in fact those, you know, those, you know, those devices are basically attached to everybody, don't you need those towers to make all that stuff work? And he said, yeah, in fact you do, right? And you have to put these things on them called transmitters and receivers, et cetera. And, you know, and, and you have to have a network. 
And so all of that stuff costs billions and billions of dollars, Catherine, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do that in the stock market. You can't do that in the equity market because you're diluting yourself down to zero. So mm -hmm. that's where the leveraged finance markets come in, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, in, in the good old days, we built things, right? We helped finance growth. We helped finance industry. We created industry, right? With mm -hmm. really a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so you look at that and you said, all right, um, that's good. And then, of course, that morphs, right? As we've you know moved down, that becomes LBOs, dividend recapitalizations, and you know, kind of the leverage finance pushing the envelope. And you can debate the the, the good and the bad about that. Um, right. I.e. Know, the, financial crisis. I yeah, the financial enough. crisis. I.e. the financial crisis. You know, yeah. but but you look at it going at the end of the day, it's a very important market, and it's peculiarly peculiarly. American, right? Where you're looking at it going, there is no high yield market outside of the US. Europe, we, I remember trying to create and start some of that stuff there. That never took hold. Asia does not have it, right? In terms of that, because they really don't have a bankruptcy code that makes sense, right? For an investor, you have to have access to collateral. And so you, you just, it, it never happened. And other markets are just small. So in Canada, as an example, lots of high yield issuers in Canada, they just have the US bond market, right? Because they just, you know, it's just easier or the loan market today, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it's it's an important market that's about 3 trillion today. And I'll tell you something, when we go down, wow. the, the world stops, right? Because that access to that kind of capital is very, very important. Um, with respect to, I, I want, I thought I'd start with the Fed, but but now that we're talking about generational trades, like trades that, you know, um, really create significant wealth as, as you talk about with respect to the cell towers, is there anything on your radar right now that you're seeing that would do the same? Well, I, I wish we'd have had that conversation in February of 2020 when you and I could clear out our garage and buy oil at negative 30, right? And it was like we were paid to store oil. That was a generational trade that lasted a couple of weeks, you know, in that regard. Now, I, I think it's an interesting one, Catherine, because I think now what we have is we have this, you know, this tsunami of, of liquidity, right, that has come in and really found its way into you know, assets, right? Financial assets primarily. Um, and now we have really, we have excess liquidity, right? Because you're looking at you know, rates and you're looking at, um, interestingly enough, this week as you and I you know, do this, LIBOR hit an all time low, right? So three month LIBOR hit 11 basis points um, that it's never been lower, right? And it's just because there's so much money sloshing around, we've overcooked it, right? You know, in terms of uh, you know, too much money. Um, but that has driven up valuations and prices. So to say there's a generational opportunity, I would say no. Um, okay. There's some things that that can be done. But I think in manias, I think that what happens is that, you know, thoughtful investors like you and I basically don't make a lot of money, but we tend to keep it. And I think that's how you get rich in manias, right, is, is, mm -hmm. is uh, have some discipline. So mm -hmm. I would be, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more worried that things are a little, uh, uh, you know, a little overvalued across the board than there is some great opportunities. Okay, F fair enough. And, and, you know, I think part of, um, you know, doing really well in addition to protecting capital and having that mindset is really being patient and waiting for those opportunities. And when you see them, you know, to get on them, um, for, for sure. I, I, quite frankly, I mean, we're going to talk about energy, but, you know, we've been pretty early on the energy trade, um, you know, and it's worked out really well. Um, even, you know, just buying Exxon. I bought Exxon, I think what it was ahead of right. over 8% over yield. I mean, why not really? But, but it, we'll, we'll, we'll get, I don't know, it, it, we'll, get, we'll get to that. But I, I, let, let's just first start with, with your thoughts on the Fed from yesterday, um, because they did pull forward their forecast from a dot plot perspective in terms of when we might see a rate hike. I don't think the market's too worried What's your interpretation? Is the market wrong? No, I think uh, I think the market actually, it's very interesting. Um, so this is something that I've been kind of, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. And and I remember, I remember our, we, we did a specific interview. I was in New York at the time. And I remember oh. the tenure was touching 3%. And I said, you need to buy that because it's going to one. Um, of course, it didn't go to one. It went to 50 basis points, right? Now, no, nobody's calling a pandemic uh, early, but... I looked at it, Catherine, and I, I think that people misunderstand some things. There are secular forces and there are cyclical forces, right? And we have a secular force in the world right now called demographics that is going to overwhelm absolutely everything else, right? Because when you get to my age, what, what do you consume, right? Now, honestly, you know, and you're looking at it going, all right, you know, your family is growing, your kids are growing, et cetera. 
and you look at it going, you, you, you really start to ratchet back your consumption. Not because you're trying to you know, save a bunch of money or do any of that. It's just that you just don't need the same things, right? And, and I look at the world and I said, I've said this for a long time, China is dying, right? Europe is dying and Japan is dying. So three of the four horsemen are d literally dying, right? From a population perspective. And, you know, again, the Chinese, the Japanese, Europe, I, I'm not really as familiar with, they're not real big on immigration, as you know, right? It's like, you're not importing a bunch of people there. So you look at that, that, that process. And then of course, in the West, uh, and by the way, Canada has a terrible demographic. You stopped having kids in Canada in 64, right? I mean, that was really the last year that you started to, you know, kind of ratchet things in. Um, but the you know, immigration much policy is very strong. Yes. And, and I was about to say, you beat me to the punchline, right? Is to say okay, that sorry. Canada, Canada <laughs> no, no, Canada understands that that has, it, it has an issue that way, right? And so it's very aggressive on the immigration front. All good. And I'm all, I'm all positive for that. Um, U.S. has a decent demographic, Catherine. I mean, it's not, it's not spectacular, but it's decent. But the problem that you still get into, and this is the big driver of rates, right? This, the problem mm -hmm. you get into is that the wealth, the money, is generally held by the baby boom generation, right? And again, back to the consumption. And here's something interesting. And, and, and this, is, this is the thing that, again, people get wrong. Everything in life, let's start with the investment business, assets, et cetera. Everything is driven by supply and demand. And the supply and demand for money is no different, right? It's a commodity. And I can tell you that outside of refinancing, there is no demand for money. And if you look at the commercial loan officer surveys, and if you look at things, and, and you're having massive amounts of issuance and high yield, and massive amounts of issuance in the bond market, but what is it being used for, right? It's being used for gains, right? Dividend recaps and leverage recaps, and it's mm -hmm. being used for refinancing. And so on a net net basis, you just don't have that, you know, that demand for money. So without the demand for money, why would yields go up? And we're back to that whole thing again. And you're saying, all right, we're not, we're not going to drive it. Short-term rates, you're overwhelmed with money right now, right? People are very worried of negative rates. This is the big topic. Don't in know, because right I, I feel like, well, there's a couple things here. Um, when you say there's no demand for money, I think people would say, well, then why... Well, how can that be true? Because the Fed has been printing money for so long because there is a demand for, for money. Now, whether they've printed too much and there's too much supply, which I think is the point, and that's you know, a lot of the fear going on right now. Um, so there's that aspect. Then also, you know, people haven't been afraid of negative rates now for a while, Tim. To your point. So, so this is where I'm saying is you're an outlier, right? Is to say the world still has negative rates. I don't know how many, uh, it was 17 trillion um, when I looked the last time, it's probably a little bit less than that. But so that's my point, right? Catherine, think about this. You're, you're an observer of markets as I am. And you're looking at it going two weeks ago or a week ago, you saw what the worst inflation print in maybe in our careers, right? You know, you're looking at it going, all right. And what, did, what happened? It was a yawn, right? Because again, you're peaking, right? In terms of this stuff. And I'm not, you know, and I'm not a, a, a fan of the government at any level, including the Fed, but the notion that, you know, some of this is transitory is absolutely the case, right? And you're looking at it going, look, we're still 8 million jobs below where we started pre-COVID, right? So yes, and by the way, you know, I'm very granular with companies. So there is a significant labor issue in lots of areas, but mainly this is because they haven't run out of the slush fund yet, right? I mean, they've been handed a lot of money. And if you're a 15 or $20 an hour job, you know, it, it, I mean, stay home, you know, I got that money coming in still versus having to go back to work, right? So I do believe that you're going to fix the labor problems. Um, and I don't think that you're that short of labor. So I'm looking at it, a lot of these things are transitory, right? In terms of even container ships that got stuck on one side or the other with China and the ports of LA and Long Beach, there's been some work done there. So that's not the thing. So I'm still looking at rates and I'm saying, they're not going up, right? I, that would be a rich man's problem. They're not going up, right? And so you're still in that same game where this hurts a lot of industries and a lot of businesses and it hurts, it hurts people, right? If you're a saver, if you've been diligent and you've done it, you're, you know, you're in, in, in or nearing retirement and you know, rates are zero, yeah. yields are zero, right? Insurance companies have broken models right now, right? Um, because insurance companies capture spread, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they underwrite historically property and casualty and uh, life to a break even, right? On their underwriting and they capture their money on the spread. There isn't a spread, right? So they're now being forced to do other things and dangerous things really in my estimation because you know, you're having to stretch to you know, generate returns and yield, right? And that's, that's a tough thing. So I just, uh, as I said, and I'm gonna go back to something you said, they, whether, mm -hmm. they, you know, whether there was an initial look, when you put people out of work, right? Yes, there's a need for money, I get it. I mean, it's like, I'm not, I'm not against it and yeah. I'm, not, you know, I'm not making a statement on that. 
but that's over, right? You know, or primarily over, and it's been over in the U.S. for a while. So, uh, did they overcook the book? Yeah, they did. You know, I mean, and that's why. Uh, back to the neg negative rates for a second. Only in the short end, that was what we're talking about, right? And right. to say that 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 very short, you know, that very short end, you're seeing repo, reverse repo, et cetera, problem. The reason everybody's worried about negative rates is money market funds, right? They implode, you know, because it's like, you know, you're not going to keep your money in a money market fund and you're losing so money that, every day. Yeah, so, so what does that mean, though, Tim? Because, um, you know, to say, and I read your note about this, um, you know, a money market imploding. I mean, I remember when, during the financial crisis when large corporations were trying to get their money back and they couldn't because they couldn't sell fast enough to get the money and et cetera, et cetera. So what do you actually really mean by money market imploding? Same, same concept of what you just said and that everybody's leaving at the same time, right? There's a single door and everybody wants to get through it. So if you're, if you're in those funds, right, you have mass exodus, um, you know, from when, those things. What would be the catalyst for that? Negative rates. So the, the, the point being is that right, right now what you're seeing is that there's all kinds of programs that are you know being implemented right now. There's I don't know what the number was. Um, a friend of mine told me it was five hundred eighty five or six hundred billion dollars. Right. Where people are at zero. I'm talking about people parking like banks in particular. Right. Where you're looking at parking um, and reverse repo as an example. And so all of this stuff is just, again, put it all together. Right. And you're looking at it going back to our rate issue. Right. I want to I want to get back to the ten year for a second because the ten year okay. in theory in theory and I, I don't think it's that far off is really your gauge of inflation right I mean in terms of that 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 the you know that marker and you know you got to a buck eighty and can, listen can you go up to two percent or two and a quarter of course I mean that's a technical issue right you get a sell off on the market at any point but the trend right we're back to a buck fifty everybody got excited yesterday or whenever the, the I think it was yesterday, yeah, right? Yesterday. It was the announcement. <laughs> and every, oh, they have nine base, everything flew by nine basis points or eight basis points. Well, that's coming off today. Last I looked, it was down five or six basis points, right? Uh -huh. So I think, I think that the, you know, I, I think that is not the challenge, right? If people are thinking you're going to get killed because rates are going to soar and the world's going to collapse and real estate's collapsing, et cetera, don't count on that, right? That's not going to be that's not going to be your issue. That, that that I'm just comfortable with that. Okay. Well, and that's a big statement. You actually started out by saying, you know, be, making it factual almost like absolutely rates aren't going higher. And you know that that's obviously a big debate in the market right now, particularly as we see those inflation numbers. So I think anybody listening, um, you know, they've got a very strong view from you in, in terms of where you stand on this. Um, but when you say that inflation won't be the problem, um, do you think that there will be one? Yeah. Or is it I something mean, we don't need to worry about right now? Well, no. Okay. But that's, <laughs> we're, we're both, we're both, too, we're, we're both too many years in this business to realize not to, not to worry. Right. I, I worry all the time. I get paid to worry. So um, yeah, you're always trying to figure out where the ball in the face is coming. Right. Cause I, my, my thought process here, right. When, when this began, Okay, so let, let's go back to COVID because this is this is very important. When we came out of the financial crisis in 09, right? You know, you look at that going, okay, so, you know, since 09 and get to January 2020, right? We had a very long period of time, 11 or 12 years, didn't have a credit cycle, right? You know, you're just like, it just kept going more leverage. In my world, Catherine, you know, what I was concerned about was, was the games that went on from an accounting perspective, right? And this is this is a bit of a deviation, but an important one. You know, more and more and more capital is going into private, right? So you've got private debt. You've had private equity 25, 30 years, right? I mean, and all that yeah. stuff. But you've got private debt markets that are arguably at least a trillion dollars now. And the challenge with private debt markets and private equity markets is the games that can be played, right? Because you don't have you don't have any public oversight, you know, so you have investors participating, but not a lot of public oversight. So in my world, in the leveraged loan market, which is, you know, my most opportunistic market, um, I watch the accounting, right? And you've, got, you've gone six, seven years, and all of a sudden, 16, 17, 18, I'm watching this, and there are ad backs and games. And of course, you and I know this nasty word called EBITDA, right? Which is the earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization, which is, it's a great valuation metric, right? I mean, it's just, it's an easy number to throw around. It's not cash flow, but it's, it's a good valuation metric. And we had ad backs to this, right? To cook the books. In effect, adding, we, we got so stupid that it's called the, the joke for us is pro forma further adjusted EBITDA. You were adding back things that were potentially 
going to happen, right? So in the future, I think I'm going to get some cost uh, reductions and I'm going to add those to EBITDA, right? And you and I are looking at that going, that's called fraud, right? It, it was like, you, that, that's not even, that's not even gimmicks. That's fraud. That's accounting fiction, right? And so I, I got very well. Well, wait, to be clear though, some of those adjustments are absolutely legal. Let's, uh, no, uh, the legal absolutely, well, but this is the point, people don't understand g- gap accounting, right? Gap accounting, you can drive a truck through, right? It's like legal is nothing to do with it, but reality is something different, right? And we teach people all the time, you read the financial statements backwards, right? Start with the cash flow statement, which you can't cook. Um, go to the balance sheet, which you know talks about liquidity, and then go to the sunshine statement, right? Which is your income statement, which is everybody's pouring the perfume on it. But the whole point of this is to say that um, it's completely legal and everybody can agree to doing it. All I'm saying is, as a veteran of the credit space, I'm worried, right? I'm like, uh-oh, we're building a bomb, you know, and I can see that this is going to be a default cycle coming, right? And so all okay. of a sudden, you're looking at it going, all right, you know, things, Catherine, things are leveraged at, you know, seven times, eight times, nine times, right? And I'm like, oh, I've never seen those really work, right? Well, so give us perspective in terms of what are you seeing right now that's seven, eight, nine times levered? What, what is Lots of things, particular? lots of things are, uh, and again, some of that stuff has been, you know, has been rationalized. I mean, before, let's just, let's finish the thought process and I'm going to swing around to the, okay. the accounting today. So wh- where I was going with that is I'm very, I was getting very nervous, very worried that you're going to have a default cycle, right? And of course, getting excited as a stressed investor, I'm like, I'm going to have opportunities. And in fact, in the third week in March, I was getting very excited because that loan market was now 75 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar. And I'm like, we can make money here, first lien term loans. And that lasted probably three days. And then the Fed steps in with their announcements and says, yeah, we're going to buy everything. And then the market's 95, right? right? I mean, that's literally what happens. Now, the question that you ask yourself is, does liquidity equal solvency, right? Just because I have a whole bunch more money, um, you know, am I now a solvent entity, right? Well, mm-hmm. the answer is in some cases, yes, you know, because it's, that's it. But Catherine, the focus right now in my business which I think is you know, something we're concerned about, is just interest coverage, right? LIBOR is zero. So effectively, if you're a spread over LIBOR and or you've gotten refinanced, average loan LIBOR 400, right? Let's look at that. It's 4%. So your interest coverage is very good, right? Because your interest expense is very little. And everybody's comfortable with that. But at the core, you're still very, very highly levered, right? So the argument becomes is that, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you know, we're going through an imminent default cycle, but for somebody like me who's actually operated in bankruptcy court and understands how that process works, I don't buy that, right? I'm like, I, I don't think the accounting and, and the math has changed in that world, right? Like, I know it's changed for private equity. I know it's changed for private debt. They're much more aggressive in terms of the leverage metrics and the valuation metrics. But for me, I look at it going, if I have a problem, right, if I have, a, if I have an issue and I end up in a restructuring, um, I'm looking at three times a rational run rate on EBITDA or three and a half times, and anything more than that is impairment, right? So I'm, I'm worried about that. Switch to today, right? Are you seeing that? Catherine, I've seen three, I've seen three sort of issues in, in businesses today. You had the one where they've been soaring, right? I mean, they've been a massive beneficiary of, you know, whatever, you know, the lock-ins, right? It's like you're selling sporting goods, or you know what home improvement stuff or whatever, off the gauge. And as a matter of fact, way above your your trend. So you got to be careful there, right? Because it's like you can't just forecast 2020 and go forward because that's not that's not going to last either. Mm-hmm. That there's a segment of the the world that's doing that. There's a segment of the world that doesn't change that much, right? You're a chewing gum company, eh? You know whatever, right? You're doing your thing, et cetera. And there's there's a chunk of business that sits in the middle that are essentials that that are doing it. And then there are the guys that get blasted, right? Where you just you know airlines, you know, cruise ships, leisure and travel, restaurants, you know, all of the, all the kind of sort of the consumer discretionary areas. Um, and I guess my problem is that that was the stuff that sort of confused me as an investor is that that stuff forecasted the recovery within two months of its demise, right? I mean, you and I talk, Royal Caribbean was printing, you know, single digit bond deals unsecured by the, you know, the third or fourth month, and they haven't yeah. sailed the ship yet, right? So I'm like, I'm not, I'm not participating in that. But that's what I see as business kind of falling through. And you're looking at it going, okay, so you know, now you're trying to get rational numbers and, and, and kind of rational run rates for companies. And then where are you, right? So we're still pretty highly levered. Um, and, and, and as I said, but you're, you're not in an imminent default situation 
as a large percentage of the asset class because you got liquidity, right? And you've got good coverage and that's not gonna change um, in the next couple of years, irrespective of what I want to happen, right? Because I would like to see yeah. that happen. It ain't gonna happen. Wow, I, I understood. So there is just so much support in the system. And we did see that, you know, within the first couple of months uh, from the Fed that buying into the high yield market, um, supporting the high yield market to the point where, you know, you don't get as many opportunities yourself personally to go in. And, and I think that that's actually what's been difficult for some of the, um, you know, hedge funds out there, people I've used to cover and have talked to, which is being a hedge fund in the era where the Fed controls so much um, has been difficult because what you would expect to see happen in terms of valuations and opportunities, um, whether, you know, buying, a, you know, 50 cents on the dollar or 75 cents on the dollar or being able to short because it doesn't make sense, they're not able to do. Um, it, it's, it, and, and so then I think you, the unintended consequence of, of one of them of that is also that you have more and more hedge funds ch chasing the exact same trade, which they often do, uh, but, but chasing the same trade in a very crowded way. Um, and, and that goes back to what we were almost talking about moments ago, which is, you know, what, what's been going on is really force people uh, and money managers, therefore, to go up the risk curve. And that's, you know, can put people in a, in a precarious position, you know, understanding like that they're kind of chasing, chasing returns, chasing valuation. So having said that, I think the one area you do think that there, you can respond to that, but also I think the one area that you think maybe has more opportunity in terms of risk and return is, is the loans market. But, but weigh in on anything I, I just said, if you like. No, I, I couldn't agree more with everything you said. And I, you and I traffic in that area. And I have friends at all those funds and they're as depressed as I am, right? Where you're looking at it going, they just took away our business. And so, you know, the one, the one nice thing about, you know, capitalism and you and I talked about this regression and reversion to the mean, right? I mean, that's a law. And so, you know, when you have, you know, deep value investors, distressed investors, whatever you want to call it, those are the opportunities that, you know, we're set up for. And the government socialized markets, right? They, they basically socialized credit. They socialized everything. And so those opportunities, as we, we joke about, but they lasted three or four days, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think everybody, you know, is concerned, um, you know, about this. Now, now I will defend some of it. Right. And, and the one Absolutely. thing that I would, totally uh, agree. Yeah, yeah, I will defend some of it because what they were trying to accomplish is that if markets seized up, right, we, we yeah. you and I saw that in 08, right, in, in 09, and that does bring the system to an end. And they were worried about that. Um, and I get it, you know, and so going to our world, right, in high yield and loans, what they did is they set up that program. And, but it was pretty interesting, Catherine, because it was pretty nuanced, right? What they had said is that they were mainly looking at the high yield ETFs. And what was interesting about that is that the high yield ETFs um, you know, can absorb, th their, their biggest issue with that was the fallen angels, right? So you have, I don't know what the number is, but it's a, a triple Bs are a massive number as it relates to the investment grade market, right? It's huge, it's like two thirds. And so if you get notched down, now you're double B, now you're junk, right? So who's going to buy that supply? Because if your mandate is investment grade, you can no longer own the paper. So that was their biggest concern, right? Yeah. And, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with the rating agencies. That's been you know, my job for 36 years. Um, but I will say, by and large, I think they did a pretty good job. I was wrong, right? Businesses did not collapse. You know, things didn't collapse as, as some, some people expected. I was thinking it was going to be a lot worse than it was. Um, and they were pretty uh, gentle on the downgrades, right? And I was like, fair enough, yeah. right? And so, so you look at it going, all right, they, they came through that system. So, you know, they didn't really, if you look at the number that they actually invested in that space, it was like $13 billion, right? Or something like that. I mean, it, it was, it, it, it was, it's nothing, right? In right. the scheme well, of a- More importantly, it, it gave confidence to the market, which is what, optics, what you need. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Optical, they, they did it. I will, I will give them credit. They did it brilliantly. It was optical engineering. They did. So, 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 you know, we, we say so it worked. And then you kind of look and say, all right, at the end of the day, where does that leave us? Right. And you're saying, okay, so you've taken away the deep discounts, right? That's, that's gone. And, and if you're, you know, again, in that space, you're, you know, you didn't get the opportunity to deploy capital and, you know, take advantage of the cycle. So be it. And it's like, doesn't matter that we think it's right or wrong. It's what happened. So now you're looking at it, and, and this is kind of this is sort of where you and I are both. Let's just put on our investor hat. Forget money managers and traders and everything. 
you and I got money to deploy. We're looking at the world and we're saying, what now? Right. Okay. You've seen the markets yeah. hit all equity markets of at all time highs across the board, you know, treasuries are you know, back of, you know, 1%, you know, on average or, or, you know, five and 10 year. And you're like, eh, you know, I mean, do, uh, that doesn't sound appealing. What do you do? How do you generate a rate of return today that mm-hmm. is reasonable? And the most important thing is getting this little word called of versus on correctly, right? I got to make sure that I can get a return of my capital before I worry about my return on capital. And I think that's the thing that people start to forget. So this is a challenge, right? And so what we've done, and we spent the last, and I've spent the last six months kind of rebuilding, right? Where we're looking at this stuff and saying, all right, where is some value? You know, because at the end of the day, how we view it, and it sounds kind of complicated, but it isn't, um, is we look and say, how much yield can we generate per unit of risk, right? I mean, and how we view it as as a valuation shop is leverage, right? So if I'm a a bond or a loan investor, a credit investor, I'm looking and saying, what's my real risk, right? Like you got duration, you've got, you know, I mean, there's, there's liquidity, there's volatility, there's all kinds of different things. But the real risk is losing money, right? And how do I lose money in fixed income? I default, right? Especially in corporate. So let's make sure that we don't have that, right? Let's, let's try to eliminate the defaults. And how you do that is making sure that your companies that you're going to invest in have lots of cash, generate cash, and have relatively low leverage multiples. And so for us, it's that and saying, okay, how much yield per turn of leverage can we get? And where does it stand on a historical basis? What's interesting about the loan market, Catherine, is that my world was always the off the run, um, which is what we call something less than 600 million in size, right? That's just the way the markets are. Mm -hmm. And that market, I operated in high yield for a couple of decades. That market gradually and slowly went to the loan space because high yield bonds became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and high yield bonds became bigger and bigger. So today, if you look at HYG and JNK, which are your two junk bond ETFs, you can't buy, those things can't buy anything under 600 million bucks in size, okay? So if you're a company and you're looking at that going, well, I wanna raise long-term capital, where do I go? And you go to the loan market, which is a hybrid of the bond market. The only real difference is that's floating rate, that's fixed rate, right? So the loan market is LIBOR plus or a floating rate. Um, and in the loan market, you know, typically if you're staying with, if we are first lien secured term loans, you actually do get collateral, right? I mean. Some of these covenants and documents are pretty thin, so don't count on you know it, it being bulletproof. But you do get you still are in first priority position, and so we looked at it and said the reason that we were always off the run is the way the rating agency models work, right? And this is, gets back to the level of sophistication in this space, and that is that if you are a company that has less than a billion of revenue, you are considered very small, okay, to the rating agencies, right? They notch that stuff down. About a third of the rating relates directly to size. I'm an investor. I really don't care if you're doing $700 million or a billion one, but one gets punished one more than the other one. And I'm like, okay, so I can get more spread and more yield because the rating tends to be lower on things that are, you know, sub a billion of revenue, which then tends to lead you to about a 500 million, $400 million tranche size, right? And that's where we add value. That market now is well over a trillion and a half dollars. And that wow. was, that's, grown, that's grown significantly from where it was, right? And you have a secondary market, Catherine, that's a little bit of opaque, it's, it's opaque, right? It's a hybrid. It trades between banks and dealers and investors, but it's not really a security, right? It's actually a credit agreement. It's got a Bloomberg ID. It's got a kind of a QCIP, oh, wow. but it doesn't, you know, there's arguments, is it a security, isn't it a security? Um, and so it's, it's a very dysfunctional market, right, which we like, and it reminded us of the old high yield markets. So we look at that and saying, can we construct something that's going to pay, and, and, and I'm surprised, but I mean, can you can get a five or a five and a half percent type number in the loan market, right? And by the way, you do have floating you know, rates. So mm-hmm. if you're a believer in higher rates, Right. You, you'll get some you'll, you'll get some protection. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not I'm not buying them because of they're floating, but I'm buying them because I can get yield you know, where I can't other way, uh, other places. But the most important thing for us is that you can take that loan portfolio um, and you can have 75 or 80 names and you can get financing against it. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're a bank. In essence, what does a bank have? A bank has loans and a bank has leverage. The average bank is like eight and a half, nine to one levered. 
the average CLO, right, which is a collateral loan obligation, which is where most of these loans are, you know, residing, um, mm -hmm. has 10 to 1 or 11 to 1 leverage, right? I don't believe in that. I think that's way too much. But you can get financing against it. So you can then legitimately generate a double digit yield in those structures, right? Okay. And your money comes, your, your money, my money comes from insurance companies. Okay, so so Tim, though, what you're describing, so that everybody's on board, because it it's a you know, it's not on. We don't. Nobody talks about this really, but it's a massive market um, that employs a lot of people that that know how to do this. So my my point though is that you're not looking at the high the uh, high yield junk bond market. Um, you're going a little bit lower because you can get a bit of more of a spread, which means you get a bit of more of a return. Um, and, but my question is, uh, are you, you're doing this in the, in the publicly traded markets, correct? And, and the reason why I'm asking is because in this search for yield, I do hear from, you know, acquaintances, friends, whatever, that they're investing in this fund because they're going out there and they're doing private loans, whereby they're deciding they're, you know, it's, it's like private equity per Kinda, not really, but like they're not buying loans, leveraged loans in a publicly traded market. They're going out there and finding some company in your town that needs a loan and creating an agreement. And people seem to get excited because they're, you know, I hear this all the time. Well, I'm making 12%. I'm closing my coupon for 12%. You're not doing that, are you? No. No. No, you're you're dead right. I mean, so what what my my contention is, so if you look at that. So this actually can tie you know, perfectly, right? So you have you know, literally a trillion dollars searching for that stuff, right? I mean, that's what you've got these middle market platforms and these private debt platforms and the biggest Canadian pension plans have been doing this for a long time. You've got individuals doing it, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, you know, a concept of replacing the banks, right? Where it's, a, you know, it's an easier document and you've got, you know, obviously you're gonna have less covenants, you're gonna have easier terms and, you know, and, and all this happy stuff. Um, I'm I'm concerned about that market just because, as you and I know, you know, how much quality merchandise is really there. And candidly, right, when you're looking at it going, you, you make a very good point. Everything that I'm involved with in loans is rated and is effectively public, right, in the sense okay. that it does have, have, a, have an idea and it does trade, right? And the amount of information and disclosure that you get is really good, right, you know, in terms of this stuff. Sometimes you'll get monthly disclosure, right? I mean, probably too much, but you know, in essence, you're certainly getting quarterly statements, you're getting, you're getting audited financials, you're getting all of the things, et cetera. My argument against that smaller stuff, and I get it, like, I mean, there are always opportunities, right? But yeah. the argument in a broad sense is, because everybody's talking to me, oh yeah, we, got, we can dial in the covenants, we can be very this and that. And I was like, okay, but I want you to think about what you're investing in. You're investing in a small business, right? Because anything, honest to God, I mean, anything on a hundred million dollar sales cap is a small business. Yeah. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but that's the world today. Yeah. And what happens in those businesses? If something goes wrong, people quit, right? I mean, it's like, okay, yeah. you're going to restructure. This isn't United Airlines, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll just be, you know, we're going to do a restructuring in a chapter 11 and we're going to, you know, get this in our recovery, et cetera. You got, you know, Joe and Jane six pack running a label company or something, and you think it's the greatest thing in the world. And it's like, oh, it gets into trouble. You think they're going to stick that out? What the hell with that? It's like, I'm going to go yeah. do something else, right? Yeah. So your recoveries could be zero. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I wanted your perspective on that because I, I've been hearing about people doing this for years. And again, nothing to our point earlier with the Fed kind of stepping in and really being supportive for all risk on assets, or at least most, um, it hasn't been an issue. But I, I just wanted to bring that up, that your opportunities in the leveraged loan market, but it's publicly traded, stronger covenants, et cetera. Very much so, yep. Okay, yep. Um, Tim, we only have about five minutes left, hard to believe. Hard to believe, right? <laughs> the TV <laughs> is like seven. Yeah, for you and um, I, that's that's a shock. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, so, but leveraged loan market opportunity, that's where you see the opportunities. Um, I do want to get your quick take, though, on oil, how much of an opportunity you see there right now. And then I, I want to briefly, I read your note as well on the green dream and taking a look at the amount of metals and minerals that are needed uh, to create Teslas and what that might mean in terms of if there's an opportunity around. Yeah, it's a hugely important topic, right? And, and, and again, I, I think that, you know, uh, and, and, you know I'm, not, I'm not particularly an oil guy, right? I'm, I'm an investor. I'm an, I'm an agnostic, you know, in, in that regard. So it's not like I'm, 
you know, again, trying to beat the drum for the industry, you know, but, but I am looking at this and I'm, I'm looking at it going, where's, where's some mispriced risk, right? And I look at this and saying, the energy business is still, mm, you know, it, it's not quite as vilified as it was, you know, maybe a year ago. I'm talking the traditional oil and gas business. And I was just like, I'm, I'm kind of looking at it just rationally. It's just, I'm a consumer, right? And everything that I consume is an oil derived product. You know I mean? That's just, there's, there is, this isn't a transition fuel, right? You know, I'm on my iPad with you today. It's an oil derived product, right? And I'm looking at my computer, get my keyboard, all that stuff. I'm looking at my iPhone, I'm doing all these things. And it's like, it, you're not transitioning away from oil, right? And so th- th- that, that's just nonsense. Um, what I'm looking and you at- You mean though, that, just so everybody knows, you mean that because plastic, resin, yes. oil. Exactly, petrochemicals and diesel. And l- l- there's a couple of other points. And, and, and I, I tried to figure this out, Catherine. It was a, a real problem for me because in March of 2020, the world shut in, right? It was completely locked in and, and we're in our jammies and nobody left home and it was what it was, right? And yet we sucked down about 82 or 83 million barrels a day. And I, I thought to myself, like, how the heck do you do that, right? And I was like, where's that coming from? Because nothing's going on. There's nobody getting into a car. Nobody's getting onto an airplane. No mm-hmm. one's going to work. And we're still sucking down this amount of, of, of oil, right? Everybody got very upset and they're just like, oh my God, it's a disaster. You know, demand's crushed. And I'm thinking, I'm the opposite of that trade. I'm like, how in God's name are we, this is the most, outside of air and water, this has got to be the most inelastic commodity I've ever seen. And so I looked at it in the opposite light and I said, okay, well, this is really good. And then I started to put together a puzzle, right? Is to say, where might that be coming from? And I just came to the conclusion that this is all the convenience economy, right? Where you're looking at it going, it's Amazon where every day is Christmas, mm-hmm. right? There's a damn box on my porch every day because mm-hmm. you're ordering this or ordering that or whatever. You're ordering a toothbrush or a tooth. You don't even go to the store, right? Yeah. It's like you, a prime delivery, it's next day delivery and we're just ordering items. Well, those things get trucked, right? And, and by the way, in my piece that I put out, I just chuckled about that whole you know, green truck dream, right? That was another Musk uh, nonsense thing from a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, that, that truck couldn't even haul its own battery, right? So there's no, there's no green trucks coming in anytime soon, right? I'm talking about tractor trailers, double tractor trailers that haul this merchandise, right? And I don't know how it is where you are, but here, and I'm in Calgary right now, I've never seen so many trucks on the road in my entire life, right? And I'm just like, oh my God, it's a disaster. So, so you, the diesel demand, right? And then you have another counterintuitive piece, Catherine, where people don't like mass transit anymore, right? Because it's dirty and you know, et cetera, right? So it's like, I'm going to probably just drive. So you have this, this counterintuitive issue and you look at the demand and the only thing that we've been missing is jet fuel, right? And my take on this stuff is I believe that you're going to see the biggest leisure travel explosion over the next year or two that we've ever seen in our lives, right? Um, I that's agree. What people want to, I right? agree. People, they want to get an airplane. They want to go travel. They want to go. All good. Right? I'm, I'm fine. Yep. But so that piece of demand is coming back. So I completely disagree with the forecast. I believe that you're going to see record demand in probably August, right? They're talking about record demand in 2022. I'm talking about 21. But I need people to think about this. The two most liberal organizations on the energy front that are producing research include Bloomberg New Energy Finance and even the IEA, which is the Paris-based organization. And you look at the T. Baral, who's coming out and saying, we need to stop all oil and gas investments right? Just immediately, because that's how we're going to get to a clean world or whatever he's thinking. And of course, the Russians and OPEC start chuckling about that, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah, well, oil's 200 bucks tomorrow, gas is 10 bucks and the world ends. It's just not, it's not even, it's not even plausible, right? It's just, it's just stupid. But the point is the IEA and Bloomberg New Energy Finance are forecasting on base cases, and they're no friend of the oil industry, continued yes. growth in oil demand for 2040. 20 years, okay? And so everybody's thinking about we're just going to be batteries and all this nonsense, right? And this ties to a problem, Catherine, in the commodity world, right? Because you've seen commodities soar, right? Copper at all time highs, 470, it's backed off now. All of these things, lithium, cobalt, graphite, right? All time highs across the board. And you're kind of like, but why? Because it's all perceived demand, right? It's not actual demand. Mm -hmm. And I would be very, very leery of entering those trades today, okay? Because I'm looking at that going, and I'm not arguing that a lot of commodities have really interesting demand supply you know, fundamentals, but I'm ar- arguing the fact is the piece that I produce, you don't have enough of this stuff for one auto manufacturer to go you know, jam in 20 million vehicles. Now we're gonna have Ford, now we're gonna have GM, now we're gonna have Volkswagen, now we're gonna have Porsche, we're gonna have all these guys. My take, and I've said this for five years, my take on the electric transportation industry is that it's going to be a tchotchke. It's going to be sports cars that are $250,000 that go to, you know, zero to a hundred and a second and, you know, and all the rest of it. But that's what it's going to be. I'm not saying that you can't, you know, add some vehicles, et cetera, but in mm-hmm. our 
investment you know parameters five years ten years etc oil is still very underowned unloved and undervalued right and you're looking at it going and i think you know i think that that's uh i think that's an opportunity for investors um i don't think it's a blip i i remember you and i before COVID hit i I thought for sure that you'd be at 70 or 80 dollars that year and then that hit but you know you're back to 70 and 80 dollars and um you know and and by the way the worry that i would have with oil is nothing to do with going down it's going up right because the oil industry always kills off the world with spikes and prices and i think you've got you've got a problem there and you just have under investment so So, i would suggest that you stay long yeah I, i totally agree stay long and where do you think the price goes um, well, wherever we think it's going to go, it's not going right because we're, we're, we're too we're too wise to think that we can figure it out. <laughs> Where I think it's going is it's gonna it's gonna go higher, right? And you're looking at it going. I I wonder, Catherine, if you get demand to let's call it 102 or 103 million barrels a day, which is not a massive you know increase from the 101 and a half we left. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know about supply, right? You're looking at it going you know, people think you can turn on a tap somewhere, you know, shale is mm-hmm. part of OPEC plus, right. In terms of their cooperating with the Russians and the Saudis, better friends than enemies. They're not going to drill a bunch of this stuff out. Um, mm-hmm. I guess your argument there is that some of the crappier rocks would work in a hundred, but how much, right. So I think it's going, I think we're going to have a problem, right. Do I think it's going to a, I love it at $70, right. It, it works for everybody. Yeah. But, but that means it's not going to stay there because markets aren't linear. Right. So probably mm-hmm. 80 uh-huh. or 90. You know, okay. that's it. But but definitely a good store of value, I think more so than gold and probably tailwind. Got it. All right, Tim, we got to leave it there. We could keep going, but um, but we can't today, but you'll come back and do this again. <laughs> and, uh, okay, sounds great. Yeah, thank you so much. That was awesome.